Hi, my name is Rodney Morales. I'm the Vice President of Equity for uh, the Ryerson Students Union. Uh, and I also want to welcome you here on behalf of the Students Union. Um, Sure. Uh, before uh, we begin, I also I want to take the time to actually uh, you know acknowledge the fact that uh, this building and this space occupies a portion of the Mississaugas of the United First Nations, uh, and for many of us uh, who are um, uh, who are settlers, uh, it's important to actually acknowledge that and to acknowledge that this land is currently under claim. Uh, I also want to read a quick statement of understanding. Um, so today, I encourage you folks to actually use this lecture as a space to, uh, to be critical and to talk about issues, but uh, to ensure that we have a collective responsibility uh, to create inclusive uh, spaces where uh, people's uh, opinions and people's uh, statements um, uh, will be treated with respect and that we uh, will be making sure that our, uh, that our comments are checked and uh, are respectful. Um, so, uh, I want to invite uh, Joanne Dallaire uh, up. She is uh, an elder with Aboriginal Student Services uh, uh, and actually is a recent uh, honorary doctorate at Ryerson uh, to do an opening for us. Oh, Dr. Dallaire. I'm the CAW Sam Clinton Chair in Social Justice and Democracy at Ryerson here, and I'd like to welcome you all to be here. Hi, my name is Rodney Morales. I'm the Vice President of Equity for uh, the Ryerson Students Union. Uh, and I also want to welcome you here on behalf of the Students Union. Um, it's a little shorter. Uh, before uh, we begin, I also I want to take the time to actually uh, you know, acknowledge the fact that uh, this building and this space occupies a portion of the Mississaugas of the United First Nations. Uh, and for many of us uh, who are um, uh, who are settlers, uh, it's important to actually acknowledge that and to acknowledge that this land is currently under claim. Uh, I also want to read a quick statement of understanding. Um, so today, I encourage you folks to actually use this lecture as a space to, uh, to be critical and to talk about issues, but uh, to ensure that we have a collective responsibility uh, to create inclusive uh, spaces where uh, people's uh, opinions and people's uh, statements um, uh, will be treated with respect and that we uh, will be making sure that our, uh, that our comments are checked and uh, are respectful. Um, so, uh, I want to invite uh, Joanne Dallaire uh, up. She is uh, an elder with Aboriginal Student Services uh, uh, and actually is a recent uh, honorary doctorate at Ryerson uh, to do an opening for us. Oh, Dr. This is the time for us to open our hearts and listen. Um, welcome very much to this opening lecture for our inaugural Rise in Social Justice Week 2011. <laughs> um, it's my great honor to have all of you here. And I just want to start off by saying October, 20, uh, October 17th, today October 17th, is the International Day for the Eradications of Poverty. It's been set up by UN, has been observed since 1993. And there was a commitment then by world leaders that we're supposed to make poverty history. And have we done that yet? Far from it. In fact, it has gotten even worse, right? Um, in Toronto, we have an unemployment rate for the youth at 18.1%. That's high. In the world globally, one child dies every four seconds, and most likely in a very far remote corner of the world. And there's a quote by Nelson Mandela saying, an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. And to me, I think this is why we organize the Rise in Social Justice Week and say, how can we reimagine social justice? How can we take the matter and work together to end poverty? And it is in that spirit we launched this event. Um, a number, we've been working on this since last May. Um, a number of the, all the, almost including all the groups, the Rise in Students Union, the Rise in Faculty Associations, 
uh, OPSU local that represents the staff here, QP local that represents the staff here, uh, the Aboriginal Student Services, CESA, the part-time students. And part of it is to try to come together and say, for us to work together, to come up with new solutions, we need to start working on projects together. And so this morning, at this, today at noon hour, we had a rally on anti-poverty and good jobs for all, where we have community folks, labor folks coming in to talk about the lack of jobs. And then we were very fortunate to be joined by the contingents from Occupy Toronto. And their presence sort of added, the, invigorated our rally even more. And it's saying that for us to move forward as a social justice movement, we need to come together. And those are moments of solidarity and those are moments of clarities. And it's in that spirit that I welcome you all here. And tonight, we're going to have a wonderful lecture by Stephen. And then we have st three student respondents who are going to take it from global to the local level and talk about their reality soon. As a, a student on campus, as a resident in Toronto. <coughs> so, without further delay, I'd like to call on one of the piece in terms of the co sponsoring. It's re been really exciting visiting different departments, different programs. And I've been here only since last January, and I've been most impressed with the diversity and the vibrancy of Ryerson as a, a downtown city university. And um, we got this. We, we also got the support and the co-sponsorship of Chang School of Continuing Education. So I'd like to call on Dean German Ferrer to come up and do a few words of welcome on behalf of Chang School of Continuing Education. As I look out on the audience tonight, I, I'm with you in anticipation of what we'll hear from uh, Mr. Stephen Lewis on tonight's topic. And as well, I think that it's really fitting um, that this is occurring tonight and it's occurring at Ryerson because in many regards, the Ryerson uh, mission relates directly to the idea of focusing on societal needs and community engagement. In many respects, uh, tonight's uh, dialogue also speaks to another uh, context for us in the regards of how do you make local effort uh, to also have global transformation. A lot of our programs here at Ryerson University really supports our students in doing exactly that. And in that regard, um, many uh, contexts, a lot of the global realities affect us locally, and a lot of our local um, efforts affect global capacity to deal with a, a range of issues. Um, additionally, uh, tonight's topic is particularly relevant um, given the realities globally and given the realities locally. So, like you, I look forward to tonight's topic and I'll turn it uh, back to you because I think the speaker um, is really the person you'd like to hear from tonight. So, thank you very much. And, and now I'd like to call on someone who has known Stephen for half of a century. <laughs> um, Walter Pittman, former president of Ryerson from 1975 to 1981. And he has called to volunteer to, to, uh, to introduce Stephen, and we are most honored to have your presence here. Yes, it has been half a century, Stephen. Uh, he was a young man representing Harvard Collegiate. And I was a history teacher in North York, and we met at a student parliament. And do you know that he dominated that parliament just as much as he came to dominate the Ontario legislature and indeed to make it a mark at the United Nations in New York. I'm not going to say very much, but I do want to say a few things. One of the things is that since that time, he began to realize that the real area of his work was not here in North America, but with Africa. The crisis, the crisis continent has been called, and he was assured himself that he was going to do something about this, with those shining faces and those wonderful, those wonderful people who knew what their needs were, and he spent a year 
not very long after he left the University of Toronto, in Africa, listening to those people. Listening, listening, listening. The great problem with orators sometimes, they don't fail, they don't listen, but this one does. He said, 34 universities are honoring with their honorary degrees. He's a companion of the Order of Canada, the highest, the highest award in Canada can give to any of its citizens. And even that seems to be a school. When he was at the University of Toronto, he debated a rather obscure uh, senator from the United States of America, and he eventually ended up with a white man. His name is John F. Kennedy. And he left John F. Kennedy virtually inarticulate, begging for mercy as he engaged in a debate with Stephen Lewis. Now, Stephen has, I think, many things to, 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 to say, and I realize, as you've already said, that he's here to speak, and you're not here to listen to me. But I want you to know something about him. And one of the things that, that this passion that he had uh, came out of, as it has gone on to the present time, the Stephen Lewis Foundation itself is, in a sense, redefining the way we help people in the third world or that the have-nots. Instead of making them further, uh, you might say, dependent upon us, it is rather listening to them seeing their needs and giving them an opportunity. And I guess the best, most thrilling, most magnificent uh, moment was when she realized that, grand that grandmothers in Africa were really the people who were keeping the situation going because the parents had died from HIV AIDS and the, grand the grandmothers who were looking after all those children. And the what had happened has been miraculous. I'm sure that when the Secretary General and then made him the, the special envoy on HIV AIDS, he had no idea he was dealing with a person like this. They'd never seen anything like this at the United Nations. In fact, I'm sure Brian Mulroney had no idea what, what he was getting himself into when he appointed him as the Canada's ambassador to the, to the United Nations. Usually, they were, they were very benign and quiet people who were good friends of the party. And suddenly, you have Stephen Lewis down in New York making a complete, putting Canada virtually on the map in terms of, of what was going on in that situation. The work did with UNICEF was unparalleled. As I say, I'm not going to speak very long, but I'm going to say this, that there's no other human being on this planet that I'm more proud of my long association with than Stephen Lewis. So some years ago, I guess I should speak past my, of course, he was a member of the New Democratic Party, and I joined him nomination. What you have is a man who has no agenda, no personal agenda whatsoever. He is absolutely free of selfishness, and, and where well, the title has become a kind of an engine of politics and indeed business in our society. You have a man here who stands in complete opposition to that, to, to, to that kind of, of, of behavior and that kind of philosophy. He cares deeply. He's going to be around here for quite some time. And I'm going to warn you, be careful of this man. Be really, really careful. He will make you think about what you are and who you are and what you're on this planet for. And he will make you very uncomfortable if in fact you can't answer some questions very, very clearly. You are so fortunate to have him here this afternoon. You are so fortunate to have him in as a distinguished professor. And I'm very, very proud to welcome and have you welcome Stephen Lewis.
gives you the sense of the continuity. We began with Walter, and there were 103, and that line was, uh, was uh, given its origins with Walter Pittman. And Walter uh, was head of the Ontario Institute of Studies and Education, as you know, head of Ryerson a number of years ago. And that contest he referred to, Walter and I, believe it or not, ran against each other for the leadership of the New Democratic Party back in 1970. And we were enormously good friends, and we had a very, very good time. And the mistake was that they didn't choose Walter. Uh, had they done so, we would have been the official opposition four years earlier. I was an ambitious, entirely egocentric young punk when I ran for the leadership. Uh, Walter, when I look back at it now, was mature and thoughtful and dignified. And the party lost its senses for a moment. Uh, and we were delayed in becoming the official opposition for a number of, of years. But I can't tell you how good it is to be here in the presence of Walter and all of you. I, um, I'm feeling inordinately sorry for myself. I have a damnable cold. I just came back from Moscow where I got the cold. Moscow was bleak and dreary and hostile. Uh, it was a combination of Stalinist architecture and, and a, kind of, uh, a kind of glitz which was entirely unwholesome. And it uh, discombobulated me entirely. And I, I, I want you to allow the milk of human kindness to flow through your veins. And treat me with compassion. Uh, I, am, uh, I am so delighted that Winnie has brought this Social Justice Week together. It's, a, it's an astonishing accomplishment. It is emblematic of the university that such a thing would happen here under Winnie's uh, stewardship. It's a brilliant initiative, and it's really clairvoyant in its uh, impact. Little did we know that merely anticipating Social Justice Week at Ryerson would rally the entire world in protest. <laughs> As a kind of symmetrical moment, uh, and, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, cheered and delighted that that's the case. It is also, as uh, Winnie said, October 17th, the International Day for the Elimination of Poverty. And I, I want to make some remarks. I, I'm going to try to be a little briefer than I normally am. As a rule, starting at 7, I would speak unimpeded till midnight. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to exercise supernatural self-discipline and attempt to deal with the subject matter in short order so that we can get to our students. But I did want to point out that the elimination of the of Poverty, the International Day for the Elimination of Poverty, is of course coincident with what we wish to achieve during the Social Justice Week in bringing people together, galvanizing the collective spirit <coughs> in order to achieve the objectives which Winnie uh, originally laid out. And the obsession with poverty, necessarily internationally, was most dramatically expressed in the year 2000 when the entire world got together in the General Assembly of the United Nations and as a matter of the affirmation of social justice <coughs> decided to launch the Millennium Development Goals which were, as you know, eight goals to be achieved by the year 2015. The basic rationale for which was to overcome the excruciating divide between the developed world and the developing world on so many issues all of which were one way or another related to poverty. So the first goal, appropriately enough, was to reduce the most extreme forms of poverty by half by the year 2015. And similarly, the most egregious forms of hunger by the year 2015. And it's worth knowing, noting that with the exception of strides that have been made in China, to a lesser extent in India, and to some marginal extent in Latin America, much of the rest of the world, particularly Africa and Eastern Europe, are still wrestling with these <coughs> impoverished conditions. And when the World Bank did a recalculation of the level below which poverty could be described, 
They chose a dollar and a quarter a day and found in an analysis that was done less than a year ago that one billion four hundred million people are living at less than a dollar and a quarter a day. Three billion people are living at less than two dollars a day. And close to a billion people are living with excruciating hunger. I have no capacity to convey to you in words the nature of hunger that afflicts so many societies and the devastating consequences for human activity and human survival that hunger and poverty induce is just heartbreaking and overwhelming and in that struggle for social justice the overcoming the elimination of poverty is, is absolutely central in global terms i'll come to canada in a few moments but that's that's a that's a centrality of what we want to discuss in the realm of social justice and it's also worth noting that these endless price increases for food around the world mean that 40 to 60 million people are added to the level of poverty and there is almost everywhere a declining agricultural productivity induced by a whole variety of factors from land grabs. Countries like China, South Korea, Taiwan purchasing huge tracts of land in Ethiopia, in Sudan, in Madagascar, and developing agricultural crops on that land for export to the countries which have purchased or leased them. Not to mention the fact that disease is significantly compromising the capacity to maintain agricultural productivity so that food has become one of the central issues around the whole question of the elimination of poverty and the dealing with hunger. And the second area of the goals was, of course, the need dramatically to reduce infant mortality rates. And I simply remind you, I have the tremendous uh, privilege of teaching some of this material here at Rice. <coughs> and I, I, I can simply remind you around infant mortality that 9 million children under the age of 5 die of preventable diseases every year internationally. And that these diseases are pneumonia, diarrhea, dehydration, measles, diseases which we have long ago dismissed as applicable to our own societies. And it's, again, wrenching. It's something I've never understood. It's something I, I, I personally cannot come to grips with. When you're dealing with the realm of social justice, how in God's name do you sacrifice nine million children with a methodical repetitiveness year after year, and the world cannot summon the intervention sufficient to rescue those lives when all the diseases are preventable? And then, of course, the third area was the reduction of maternal mortality, where we have 350,000 to half a million women dying in childbirth every year. We have all of the sophisticated skills of the world about uh, emergency obstetric interventions. We know about birth attendants. We know about midwives. We know about moving women when they're in difficulty in labor from a rural hinterland. To a, to a central urban hospital or clinic, and we still cannot reduce the numbers. And again, I, I, I simply will never understand how the world abides this excruciating reality. I mean, think about it for a minute. For 25 years now, without interruption, we've lost half a million women every year in China. And for whatever reason, 191 nations gathered at the United Nations in New York. God knows how many agencies endowed with resources beyond the dreams of avarice. UNICEF has $4 billion a year. UNDP has $6 billion a year. The World Food Program has similar sums. It isn't as though they are constrained by resources as so much of the rest of the world is. And we're unable to reduce the carnage amongst Women. It's, just, it's just unconscionable. And the fourth area is getting every kid of primary school age into primary school. And believe it or not, there are still 70 to 100 million children who should be eligible who are not in primary school. The overwhelming majority, of course, thank you, girls, because girls are always isolated and marginalized and discriminated against. 
And the reason these kids are not in school is that they can't afford the school fees, they can't afford the books, they can't afford the, the pencils or the pens to write in their notebooks. They, they can't afford the examination fees, which are widely applied in many developing countries. They can't afford the fees for the parent-teachers associations. And there never used to be fees in, uh, in places like Africa. The fees, were, the fees were the special endowment of the World Bank which contrived something called structural adjustment programs in the 1980s and 1990s and said to many of the, many of the developing countries, we'll give you money, but there are conditions attached. And the condition is that you've got to apply a user fee to the money we give you. So <coughs> societies which have never before had to pay for education. Suddenly said to the parents, you want your child to be educated, you've got to pay for it. And God knows how many children over the course of the last 25 years have been denied of education because of the perverse economic policies of the World Bank. I'd like to wring their necks. Uh, and, and I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not fundamentally an aggressive person. Uh, although I dream of aggression on a daily basis, since nothing else seems to work. But it's, it's, just, it's just monstrous, the things that we have done in the kind of Reagan-esque ac application of capitalism uh, to, uh, to so many developing countries. And the, and the fifth uh, objective <coughs> is, of course, to attempt to approximate gender equality. And, and, and it's so fascinating. I, I think it's fair to say that gender equality is the single most important struggle on the planet simply cannot have a decent international community if you're going to marginalize 50% of the world's population, which we do with reckless abandon. And it's also worth noting that it took us to the year 2011 before the Nobel Prize was awarded to women for the work they do in the realm of women's rights. There were some women who received the Nobel Prize for work on the environment, for work on the landmines campaign, but for the first time, 2011, just think of it, we finally honored three women, one of them uh, being Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the president of Liberia, with the Nobel Prize for the work they do on women's rights, primarily for the work they do to protect women from the depredations of men and for the perpetrators of sexual violence and the vast panoply of injustice that is visited on women and is itself, without question, the most dominant feature of the struggle for social justice. You want a cause? Let me tell you that the cause around women's rights is a cause that can animate this world forever. And it's the entire range of uh, international sexual trafficking and child marriage and female genital mutilation and absence of property rights, and absence of inheritance rights, and absence of economic and political autonomy, and the contention of sexual violence, which is so uh, deeply and damagingly, destructively felt in Kenya, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Zimbabwe, some of it politically orchestrated, some of it related to conflict, all of it most uh, depressingly and brutally focused on women as the target. And the fact that in a place like the Congo, you have the single largest peacekeeping force in the world, over 20,000 peacekeepers, and they cannot protect the women. And you have 12 United Nations agencies, supposedly united, ostensibly united, to protect the women, and they cannot prevent the violence. And you have Security Council resolution after Security Council resolution, and they cannot. And yet, if it were done to men, you can be damn sure that it would have ended 20 or 25 years ago. But because women are the target, the world can never bring itself to an intervention which would allow it to bring to sexual violence and the raping to an end. Uh, I work uh, with a little organization in the United States called AIDS Free World. And back in 2008, we were approached by an NGO in Zimbabwe called the Girl Child Network, where they said to us, Mugabe has unleashed his war veterans and his youth corps to rape the women of the opposition. 
to gang rape and brutally savage women simply because they are leading or voting for the opposition parties. And can you please do something about it? And we went in and we took a large number of affidavits from women all over the country. We uh, secreted them out of Zimbabwe. We took the affidavits with uh, various law firms in <coughs> Botswana and, uh, and uh, South Africa. I'm glad these people are joining us and I shall deal with their issues. Exactly. In fact, I wrote it down just a second because I wanted it to be right. We're here. We're unclear. Get used to it. <laughs> and I, I wanted to make the point that the, that the terrible raping and sexual violence which characterized Zimbabwe in the uh, middle of the elections in 2008, the entire world knew about, knows about it now, knows that another election is coming in 2012, knows that the rape camps to which the women were taking are still in existence and will be employed again, and we're having tremendous difficulty getting anyone at the Security Council even to raise it or to acknowledge it. And, and again, if you're looking for international causes for social justice, then the cause of gender equality, it seems to me, trumps and transcends all others. And the seventh uh, Millennium Development Goal, which speaks to the realm of social justice globally, uh, was uh, a, a, a role of environmental sustainability. That was the target. And that, of course, speaks almost entirely to questions of climate change and to the, uh, and to the endless focus on global warming, which the world requires, because all of the work that is being now around social justice and indeed the Occupy Toronto and Occupy Wall Street phenomena, all of these activities will ultimately be sabotaged by the consequences of global warming and climate change if we do not take this phenomenon seriously. Uh, the carbon discharge seems to know no limits because of the melting of the Arctic caps, this is really quite fascinating, Exxon has just entered into an extraordinary agreement with a Russian oil company for hundreds of billions of dollars potentially to go after oil at the bottom of the Arctic because the melting has proceeded so far as to open passageways for exploration to take place. This was never the case before. And there is a feeling that whether it's oil or coal or natural gas, the discharge of carbon will continue, which ultimately will compromise everyone, because there is bound to be some kind of convulsion before the middle of this century. You want a social justice cause, that's a social justice cause, because inevitably the consequences of global warming will be most dramatically felt by the poorest people in the world. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that Southern Africa will be the target for much of the global warming results because the drought and the conflict over water and the diminution of agricultural productivity will haunt those people forever. And the number, because arithmetically I'm always out of sequence, I really resent technology generally <coughs> and numbers in particular. Uh, I had to make a speech yesterday where someone said to me, we're tweeting during your speech, Mr. Lewis. I said, I'll lay me in my grave without tweeting. Um, uh, I'll never be a part of this socialist, rancid, social media paranoia. Uh, and, so, and, so, and so, for God's sake, contain yourselves. Like, most, most of you are out of control. The, 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 the sixth goal to which I did not direct myself 
And that's because I've talked at it non nauseum in Canada was the goal to turn back the pandemics of AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And may I just say to you that even though under antiretroviral treatment, AIDS is considered now in Western societies to be a chronic disease, on a continent like Africa, there are between five and six million people in treatment, finally. And there are between nine and 10 million people who require treatment today. And God alone knows whether we'll ever get it to them because the resources are drying up and the interest in the Western world to sustain the lives of those who are infected is in really serious decline. And that comes at a moment which is ironically immensely frustrating because for the first time ever we know how to defeat the pandemic. There is a theory which has now been proved astonishingly in practice that if you can put everyone who is HIV positive into treatment, it will lower the viral load in their body and give them antiretroviral drugs. It lowers the viral load in their body to undetectable levels. And then if they have unprotected sex, the transmission of the virus is extremely diminished, if at all. So the studies have shown increasingly that where you get widespread treatment, you get very significantly reduced transmission. And the National Institutes of Health in the United States, which tended to treat this somewhat cynically, did an amazing study with some 10 to 13,000 couples where one was HIV positive and the partner was HIV negative. And the study was to end in the year 2013 to see whether or not those who were HIV positive and on antiretroviral treatment would transmit the virus less significantly. And they stopped the study several months ago because they found that the reduction in transmission under full treatment was 96%. And they suddenly understood, as the whole world understood, that we had an answer. And precisely at the moment when it's possible to contain the human carnage, the world is moving away with the resources. And the final, uh, the final number of the Millennium Global Goals was an effort to achieve partnership so that the developed world would not so significantly violate the commitments that it made. And, and it's worth thinking about that for a moment. Since 1969, we have had a target in the developed world of 0.7% of GDP of gross domestic product as the basis for foreign aid. Canada has never come closer than 0.49. Right now, we're down to around 0.29. And because we've frozen foreign aid, it will drop to 0.28 or 0.27 by 2015. The average for the entire world is around 0.3. So we are raising less than half of what was agreed to in 1970, over 40 years ago. Secondly, the agreement at Glen Eagles in 2005 that Africa would have $50 billion more per year by 2010 in order to respond to the issues which perplex it, we were 50% below the target. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, which is the most important financial vehicle in the world to deal with those infectious communicable diseases, just postponed the 11th round of its disbursements from 2011 to 2012 and announced that the amount of money it had would be reduced from 1.8 billion to 800 million because of the decline in donor financing. It is just appalling and beyond belief how whole fabrics are being shredded, in particular the human fabric, by the unwillingness of governments to honor the commitments they made. And today I pick up uh, a note on my computer about the cutbacks that are being contemplated in the United States, the consequences of which have now been calculated specifically by statistical agencies in the United States, and the cutbacks which are now being considered in Congress will lead to the following. More infants will be born with HIV 
because of reduced funding to the prevention of mother-to-child transmission programs, food education and livelihood assistance will not be available to 419,000 children through the Presidential Fund to prevent AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Funding to treat 403,000 people for HIV AIDS will not be available. 1.9 million fewer insecticide-treated bed nets to present, prevent malaria will not be delivered. 44,000 fewer people will be treated for tuberculosis. And through multilateral programming, 1.1 million fewer combination vaccines will be made available. Now just think about it for a moment. You want a war in Afghanistan? The money is always available. You want a war in Iraq? The money flows like a river. You want a war in Libya? The money is instantaneously available. You want to give particular support to bail out the banks? The money is always available. You want to make certain that corporate bonuses remain in place? The money is always available. Why is it that the money is available for war and for the multinational excrescences of capitalism? But a tiny fraction of that money is never available for global public health. You want a social justice policy. In Canada, the same struggle for social justice is reflected in the erosion of, uh, of equality and the growing numbers who are impoverished. Do you remember when Ed talked in 1989? I was sitting beside Walter and I was thinking about it just before we, we, we started. In 1989, uh, Ed Broadbent introduced a resolution into the House of Commons supported by every single member in the House, regardless of party, to eliminate child poverty by the year 2000 comes the year 2000 and the numbers, the absolute numbers of children in poverty have increased and the percentage increased, uh, the percentages have increased as well. The richest 1% in Canada, 246,000 Canadians with an average income of $405,000 a year took almost one third of all the income growth between 1997 and 2007. 1% took almost one-third of all the growth in income. By the end of 2009, 3.8% of Canadians controlled $1.78 trillion of wealth in Canada, representing something like 67% of the wealth in the country. And the gap, according to outfits like the Conference Board, and for me, more legitimate outfits like the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, the gap is forever widening, forever widening. And naturally, therefore, we see the kinds of protests we are seeing. The inequality which is felt acutely by Aboriginal peoples, the inequality which always has an ethnic or racial dimension, the inequality which certainly has a gender dimension, whether one is speaking about jobs, poverty, daycare, housing, transit, disabilities, the nature of our First Nations, these are enormous struggles around the quest for equality, enormous struggles against inequality, enormous struggles against poverty which compromise the lives people lead. We have dropped from, 22nd, from 14th place to 22nd place in the list of OECD countries on the basis of our inequality index. In Canada, inequality between the rich and the poor relentlessly proceeds. So naturally, you get this magnificent group of protesters 
who occupy Wall Street and occupy Bay Street. And, and, and I have to say that the rest of the world is looking on and thinking to itself, it's about time that, uh, that people responded as they should respond to the inequality even in countries like the United States and, and Canada. And what's so interesting about it is that, of course, the protesters tend to be very young, and so many of them are new to the realm of social protest. Naomi Klein, uh, a, a young woman for whom I have an unbounded respect and admiration, <laughs> and that has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, any personal matters. Um, although my son is now at home and told me to say that. Uh, I, I, I can't get over the speech that Naomi made uh, to the protesters on Wall Street. It, 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 was, uh, it was quite extraordinary. She made the point that in 1999, there was the major anti-globalization protest in Seattle. And she, she pointed out that while those protests were tremendously important, they were around a single event. They were around a G8 meeting, or an IMF meeting, or a World Bank meeting. Uh, they, they were always focused on a meeting, and they didn't have durability because when the meeting was over, the protest was over. But what's different about this is that it's, it's not around an event, it's around a, a fixed target. And the dispute can go on for as long as you want it to go on. It will endure. You can put down roots in this protest. I love the fact that it's a non-violent protest and people are so punctilious about making sure that it's respectful and dignified and non-violent. It can be energetic and abundant, uh, of course, but it is non-violent and it stands for that whole realm of targets which deserve to be excoriated. And then Naomi points out, and I'll read directly, 10 years later, it seems as if there aren't any more rich countries just a whole lot of rich people. People who got rich looting the public wealth and exhausting natural resources around the world. The point is, today everyone can see that the system is deeply unjust and careening out of control. Unfettered greed has trashed the global economy and it's trashing the natural world as well. We're overfishing our oceans, polluting our water with fracking and deep water drilling, turning to the dirtiest forms of energy on the planet, like the Alberta tar sands, and the atmosphere cannot absorb the amount of carbon we're putting into it, creating dangerous warming. The new normal is serial disasters, economic and ecological. I, I was astounded by what's happening in Bangkok, a city of nine million people, has a flood from the surrounding rivers which endanger the entire population. The Americans are sending helicopters over to rescue people. The, these climatic convulsions, which Al Gore has now directly linked to global warming, are of course increasing both in frequency and in intensity. So Naomi goes on to say, what climate change means is that we have to do this on a deadline. This time our movement cannot get distracted, divided, burnt out, or swept away by events. This time we have to succeed. And I'm not talking about regulating the banks and increasing taxes on the rich, though that's important. I'm talking about changing the underlying values that govern our society. That's hard to fit into a single media-friendly demand. And it's also hard to figure out how to do it, but it's no less urgent for being difficult. And then she says, we've picked a fight with the most powerful economic and political forces on the planet. That's frightening. It's so interesting that at the World Economic Forum in Davos this year, they expressed concern, these multinational corporations who get together in this self-congratulatory charade every year. They pointed out that the most significant thing was inequality, and they better deal with inequality. That is to say, how do they take hold of an issue in order to pollute it for everyone else? And then he goes on to say, and as this movement grows from strength to strength, it will get more frightening. Always be aware that there will be a temptation to shift to smaller targets, like, say, the person sitting next to you at this meeting. After all, that's a battle that's easier to win. Don't give in to the temptation. I'm not saying don't call each other. 
But this time, let's treat each other as if we plan to work side by side and struggle for many, many years to come, because the task before will demand nothing less. Let's treat this beautiful movement as if it is the most important thing in the world, because it is, it really is. And I, I want to say to you that I, I'm not taken aback that there aren't finite demands, that it feels a little messy, that's the nature of the democratic process. As a matter of fact, the absence of specific demands gives the movement strength. Because every time you make a demand, it can be dismissed by the establishment individually. And the fact that there are so many demands and we are inching our way to a rationale means that along the way, there will be accommodations made and the movement will have some real successes. It is noteworthy that in honor of Martin Luther King just a couple of days ago, President Obama publicly acknowledged Occupy Wall Street and attempted gradually to incorporate them into his own dialectic. That's quite a bit of movement in one month for the President of the United States. So don't any of you ever feel anxious. The gains will be made and the accommodations and concessions will be made. It's just a question of keeping at it. This is a university. I wanted to pretend to academic credentials, because I don't have any. Uh, they allowed me to profess to profess, uh, but I don't have credentials. But I did remember R.H. Tommy's wonderful book on equality, which I read when I was a, a kid. And, uh, and I wanted just to read, even if it's a little arcane and in the fairly overwrought prose of 1931, read as follows. Whatever conclusions may be drawn from the history of the last decade, for him that was 19, the 1920s, one at least is indisputable. It is that democracy is unstable as a political system as long as it remains a political system and nothing more. Instead of being as it should be, not only a form of government, but a type of society and a manner of life which is in harmony with that type. To make it a type of society requires an advance along two lines. It involves in the first place the resolute elimination of all forms of special privilege which favor some groups and depress others, whether their source be differences of environment, of education, or of pecuniary income. It involves, in the second place, the conversion of economic power, not now often an irresponsible tyrant, into the servant of society, working within clearly defined limits and accountable for its actions to a public authority. Since to take these next steps is within our own power, we have less to fear from shocks from without than from nervousness within. If in this country democracy falls, it will fall not through any fortuitous combination of unfriendly circumstances, but from the insincerity of some of its professed defenders and the timidity of the remainder. It will fall because when there was still time to make it unassailable, public spirit was too weak and class egotism too strong for the opportunity to be seized. If it stands, it will stand not because it has hitherto stood, but because ordinary men and women were determined that it should, and threw themselves with energy into broadening its foundations. To broaden democracy's foundations means, in the conditions of today, to destroy plutocracy and to set in its place an equalitarian society. You see, I could have been with you today. These intonations, currents, rivulets of social justice suffuse the human condition. And what is happening now with the protest movement is one of the most exhilarating phenomena of our times. The fact that it should coincide so exquisitely with winning social justice week <laughs> is, uh, is, is not just fortuitous, it's divinely ordained. <laughs> and I, I, I want to say to all of you uh, that it would be really helpful and useful and appropriate to participate in the week uh, fully.
and to recognize that these struggles for social justice are global and local and never ending. Thanks for having me. Uh, I saw what was going on. I lived there. And 
And I came and I landed at a place that was north of Pickle Lake. I don't remember exactly where. And what he was really trying to say to me is open your eyes because what, you're, what is in our country is nothing to be proud about. And your ideas, Mr. Smart President, has got to become more clear on the realities of what we are facing in Canada because your ideas that you were having about internet and let's do this and let's do that, assume people had houses. Assume people had internet. They had no, no, I had no sense, to be quite honest, of what he was trying to solve and the importance. And, I, and to me, he's one of Canadian Canada's heroes because rather than spending all this time talking and wishing, he was at least, least doing and doing as best he could and trying to make a difference. So what I would say as you got my juices going, uh, Stephen, is that all of these issues that are around the world, we have to look in our own backyard because they exist here. So, uh, Winnie, I'm proud to be here. I'm proud that uh, our university has taken the lead in this social justice. And I tried to think to myself, how would I describe social justice? Because, you know, you could do Google whatever. And I thought I would try it in my own way as I re reflect upon what I, my Pickle Lake experience. And I put it, it's about providing to everyone the opportunities that their dreams of a better day and their aspirations are all possible. And when you stop dreaming and stop having aspirations, then life ends. So what we're all about is giving everyone the belief and the confidence that tomorrow could be a better day. And their understanding is that all of us here and all of us on the street, whether it's Wall Street or whatever street, is hand in hand with them to bring about the types of changes that society so desperately needs. So thank you very much for giving me. Thank you, Stephen, for pushing me to tell my story. Otherwise, I would not. And thank you all for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheldon, um, and thank you, Stephen. Um, so uh, before we move on to the next uh, section, we're just going to have uh, three student respondents come up and uh, we really wanted to make sure that before we opened up to uh, question and answer that um, this, the format of the event actually takes in uh, multiple perspectives and uh, Stephen drew a lot on, uh, on, on global movements and global issues and uh, students on the ground every day are, are faced with local issues uh, to kind of add a different flavor to it. Uh, I also just wanted to uh, take a time to, uh, to personally acknowledge uh, the folks uh, and everyone who's been at Occupy Toronto. I think um, the Occupy movement actually provides a critical space for us to, uh, to be looking internally uh, at our movement, but also um, talking about how do we actually bring these issues out on the streets and uh, extend them beyond sitting in a lecture room, uh, extend them beyond talking from privileged perspectives and um, really motivating people to get frankly, get out of their offices, to get out of uh, their desks, to get out of their uh, the places that they are in, and to go out on the streets talking to people uh, and be bringing people in. Uh, I know personally for me, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Twitter, <laughs> I'm a Facebooker, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm astounded by, um, by different people uh, and how the conversation is going on, and I think that's how we build a movement. Uh, we have to go beyond talking uh, to, uh, to ourselves and uh, to doing different tactics uh, that bring in different people. So to those of you who are, um, and to those of us who are uh, withstanding the, the temperatures, who are out, uh, who are having conversations with people with questions, who are um, attracting media attention, who are getting people inside their homes talking about these real issues of inequality and poverty, uh, I say bravo and I say thank you and I encourage all of us uh, to be joining them too. So uh, to my left here, we have uh, three students at Ryerson. Can folks hear me okay? Yeah? yeah, it's kind of hard to lean in. Um, so three students at Ryerson um, who will be, uh, you know, sharing a couple of words, uh, sharing their views. Oh, back up, back up, back up. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. It's like no monitors here. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Yes, let's all back up. Um, so, uh, three students uh, at Ryerson uh, who are going to be sharing uh, their views of social justice from, from more of a localized perspective. Uh, first, we'll have, uh, and please don't hurt me if I mispronounce the names, um, Andrea oh, OJ. Uh, who is a student for uh, the Department of Sociology, um, uh, as well as Dominic Wong, who uh, is a continuing education student and also the president of the Continuing Education Students Association at Ryerson, uh, as well as uh, Be Becky McFarland, uh, who is a student for the School of Disability Studies. Um, so, Jivong, you have five minutes. Feel free to go. I'm the order. We'll get your mic. Um, and we recognize uh, hunger is a, a real problem 
And uh, I'm really glad that uh, along with the Ryerson Students Union, we uh, operate a community food room uh, on campus here uh, to provide uh, food to uh, students uh, and community members. Um, but uh, one of the, uh, actually one of the uh, um, other important uh, resources for our bodies that we, we've been working on a lot is uh, access to public water. And uh, so beginning with uh, this, the uh, working on the uh, Site 41, uh, shutting down site, uh, the proposed Site 41 uh, in North Simcoe, they were going to put a landfill uh, in an area threatening the groundwater uh, for people, and also working on the bottled water-free campaign. I'm really glad that Ryerson uh, is, I'm actually really proud to be a Ryerson student because it's a very progressive place to be, and the administration is really supportive and very progressive. So um, we've, uh, Ryerson has become the third university in Canada, the first in Ontario to uh, pledge to go bottled water free so that by... <laughs> so, um, uh, so everyone uh, bring your bottles because by 2013 there won't be a sale of uh, bottled water on campus. And another thing that uh, we're working on right now is a uh, um, fight to uh, end the mega quarry, the proposed mega quarry up in North Dufferin. And uh, it's had a deceit from the very beginning, since the inception of uh, the, the proposal for this mega quarry, but not only will it destroy prime agricultural land, it's uh, also going to threaten the, the water affecting over a million Ontarians. So we've already seen uh, the provincial government order an environmental assessment, uh, and we're really hoping to, to stop, uh, stop that mega quarry altogether. So we also we have petitions outside, and we're giving out bond signs. Um, and another thing that I wanted to touch on was uh, a number of, uh, well, Mr. Lewis uh, earlier spoke about some of the structural adjustments that are imposed on, on countries. And uh, I, I guess we kind of have a, a mayor who is trying to, improve, uh, uh, try to impose some structural adjustments on our own city. And, um, and I'm glad that uh, this summer uh, we've had a lot of opposition, we've had a lot of democratic uh, process, a lot of people coming, hundreds of people coming out and uh, to uh, the executive uh, meetings at City Hall. And uh, Caesar, a lot of our executives went uh, on our own or as representatives to talk about, uh, talk about how these proposals would affect students and affect uh, people in general. And uh, I know my message was, very, it was a short story about a future where uh, in the city everything was completely privatized and the kind of obstacles you'd have to face on a daily basis um, and I, I was asked about uh, the different levels of uh, public benefit and things that could benefit one person if they actually benefited everyone. And though I didn't have enough time to respond, I wanted to make an analogy about living inside a gated community and where even if you have enough money uh, to pay for your own private services, you're still at a loss when people around you are, are desperate and poor. And every time you leave your compound, uh, you have to deal with the real world. You'll be a target of people who can't afford to uh, live, and clearly when you have wealth, you have to walk with security and bodyguards. Um, you don't benefit from public services like libraries and parks. You don't receive good customer service uh, anywhere you go, and you look around and see misery. So I can't really imagine people who would want to live in a world like this if they actually stopped to think about what their community would look like if they had no public services. So, as a student, it's pretty obvious that uh, an educated, uh, the education I receive and the subsidies that go into my education don't just benefit me, but they benefit everyone. Uh, that uh, an educated uh, population uh, really benefits all of society. Uh, and I think people are starting to realize this. Um, so I think we do need to continue this momentum. Uh, Rob Ford probably didn't realize it was going to unite so many people, uh, but when hundreds of people came out against his uh, cuts, uh, that's the kind of grassroots civic engagement that uh, we need. And we have the Occupy movement just downstairs uh, when I was walking in. And even at Caesar, we're undergoing a democratic re renewal, rewriting our bylaws and trying to get people more involved. So I'm really, it's really hard to engage uh, our membership um, but, and to get people interested and civic-minded. But I am very hopeful seeing a real change here. And I'm really hopeful that uh, this is a change across the board and a drop in the levels of apathy that have really paralyzed uh, social progress for a while. So um, I am just hope that any of our members would get involved with us, any full-time students here with the RSU, and just getting involved in your communities. So uh, thank you for all your time.
Um, so I really struggled like for days and days about what I wanted to say um, here and you know we were asked to act as respondents so technically we should have just listened and responded but of course we you know we're all madly preparing ahead of time um, and first of all um, so I first I wanted to sound really smart because Stephen Lewis you were an incredibly smart and articulate uh, person and an incredibly special person uh, and I think you know there are so few people who talk about the issues that you talk about um, who actually don't have to think about them or talk about them every day. People who have to think about and talk about the experience of being marginalized um, because they are every day of their lives understand why they talk about it. But there are so few people who do it because they actually um, believe in a better world, uh, even though they could probably get by just fine, not even ever having to imagine what that world looks like. And I do think that that's a very remarkable um, thing. Um, it's kind of, this, this notion of sounding smart is kind of why I came back to school. Uh, and I went uh, to school 15 years ago, I went to York. In fact, I occupied the president's office when Charles <laughs> Levy was the vice president. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I left, I left before I completed my degree and I've worked for the last 12 years in the community sector and I work within the psychiatric survivor community, a community um, that is very personal to me. Um, and I decided to come back to school because I wanted to sound smart. Um, and because I wanted to try to make sense of the world. Uh, and I think that, you know, being in a university helps with that. Um, being able to think and write uh, and critique uh, and try to make sense of the emotions that you feel living in a world that is so unjust. But in some ways, just existing in an environment where you're allowed to do that is a little, is cold comfort in some ways. There has to be, there has to be more than that. Uh, and in some, that's why I'm so inspired um, by the Occupy movement. Uh, poverty is soul destroying, and I've been poor, and I know, um, but it's also the fear of being poor that I think is really soul destroying. And I think that is something that so many of us, even those who have never been poor, uh, think about all of the time. And I'm really interested in this whole idea of the fear of being poor that I think motivates so many of us to be so awful towards one another. Um, and I, you know, the ways in which we scapegoat one another. And I've stopped reading the comments to, like, you know, you go online and you read an article and then there's all those comments after. Um, and they're always so awful. And I wonder if, why, are, why is it always just the awful people that read, the, like, the comment? And is it just the awful people that comment? And we're all reading them being like, why are people so awful? I don't know whether we're supposed to comment more um, or whether we're trying to figure out why those awful people comment so much. Um, but the way in which um, we scapegoat, and the very obvious ways that we pick the people in the world that there are, there are to blame for all of the reasons why we're poor, you know, you know, that we struggle, um, and we know the list: newcomers, single moms, people on assistance. Um, but there's also, I think, um, another version of that, which, dare I say, sort of is identity politics and the way in which we, out of fear, that we can't reconcile or comprehend why we treat other people badly, we hold so tight to our own experience of being marginalized. Uh, and I think that we need to think about um, how we uh, can get better at not holding so tight to our own experience of being wronged uh, and accept responsibility in how um, we uh, are part of that wronging. I could go, I, I became very cynical and you know, when I was a student, I felt so hopeful and I felt that there was you know, infinite possibility in what the world could be. And I have spent 12 years working and feel like I found myself over time becoming more and more cynical in this really in small incremental way that I didn't even realize I was becoming so cynical. Um, and I, you know, a lot of, and I've really been questioning that, and I had a child three years ago, and that has really forced me to question that a lot, because I think a lot about the kind of world that I want her to inherit. Um, and so I, in the last few weeks, have felt like I've taken off the cynicism 
like this jacket. I got to go to Wall Street. Uh, I've spent time at the Occupy Toronto stuff. And I'm realizing how um, thin, like how easy it is just to sort of step outside of that cynicism. Um, uh, I, I don't have much time. There's a couple things I want to say. There's a million things I want to say. Um, but the, I want to say something to the people participating. We can't underestimate the importance of having conversations with people. Um, and talking to people about how they experience the world. And one of the things I've really noticed in both the Occupy Wall Street and the Occupy Toronto movement um, is the extent to which we ask people to participate in our movement without actually having the kinds of conversations that let people understand why it is that we take the position that we do. Um, and when I had many conversations when I was in New York and also when I was in Toronto with people who were just standing on the sidelines, right? So I've been on a couple marches and there's all these people lining the sidewalks and everyone is yelling, come join us, come join us, this is for you, right? And I think that we have to do more than just say to people, come join us, this is for you. We have to tell them why. We have to have those conversations about why is it that there's such a thing as the 99% and the 1%. Um, because it really doesn't take a long conversation to have people buy in to that concept because 99% actually experience it and live it every day. Um, and so even though uh, we can have a movement that doesn't have demands, that movement has a responsibility to have conversations with as many people as they can possibly have conversations with about why this is in their best interest and why the life that we are told is in our interest, in fact, is not in our interest at all. Because it's not gonna take years to get to that place. It is gonna take sentences. It is like, you know, floodgates opening. Uh, and I also want us to remember that we are standing on the shoulders of giants in many ways. There are many people that came before us who have fought these fights, that who have a lot to offer and to give us in terms of answers to the way forward. And we need to recognize the fact that this is not a starting place, that we've been fighting this uh, for years, generations, and that we will continue to fight it to the point where we no longer have to fight it anymore. Uh, and I believe really, I believe it because I have to believe it because I've realized, and I mean maybe I just was missing something, but I've realized that reimagining social justice, you have to believe that a better world is possible. Your starting place has to be that we are capable of fundamental social change. And if that is your starting place, the rest will follow. I really believe the rest will follow. And the last thing I want to say is that, you know, a universe, universities have, along the lines of all of the other institutions that we live under, have become businesses. And even though there is amazing work and amazing progressive people that exist within universities. If we are, if our starting place is social justice, we need to change the way in which academic institutions think of themselves. Because they should not, we should not see ourselves on the sideline, we should see ourselves as part of the movement. And if we can use the power of those institutions to propel this movement, then we'll just get there faster. Amazing. Okay, so I feel. Um, an audience urge to, to talk and to ask questions and to uh, to respond to uh, either Stephen or the respondent. So um, I'm gonna ask maybe if Stephen can come back up. Things that have been mentioned, um, different perspectives that have been brought up, and um, many of us are here for many different reasons. Some of us are students, uh, some of us are staff, some of us are faculty, some of us are just community members who've heard about this. And I think um, each and every single one of our perspectives are important uh, in the different fights and the different movements that we are trying to lead and trying to reimagine and trying to change uh, are uh, collectively uh, what will make a better world. Uh, so um, you can have. Uh, so we're going to have two volunteers go up um, the two aisles. 
Uh, if you uh, have any questions, just raise your hand. Um, we'll try to uh, make sure that we're uh, giving gender parity and um, ensuring that different voices are being heard. Um, because of time and because there are, believe it or not, hundreds of you here, um, I'm just going to ask to, yeah, try to, I don't want to you know, censor anyone, but just make sure that it's uh, brief, brevity, brevity. Um, okay, so let's just start going up, and, uh, and if you have a question specifically for a particular person, um, do state who that can be for, but if it's generally and broad, anyone can take a jump at it. I'll try to figure out this mic. First person, let's, well, let's start going up. One. Yeah, and let's maybe take a, a couple of questions at a time. So let's say uh, we'll begin with two, uh, and when time really starts getting crunched, we'll, we'll speed it up and see how we can complete them. So let's just take one here, and then uh, let's find a second on this side. Anyone?
to take our questions of poverty, disease, and conflict seriously. You're not going to get it from Merkel. You're not going to get it from Sarkozy. You're not going to get it from David Cameron. And it would be a miracle if you got it from Stephen Hart. <laughs> so, the, so, the, so the fact of the matter is that there is no voice at the moment in the major powers of the world dealing with these issues and working at the United Nations as well. And that's what has to change. You and that's one of the things the protest movement can do is to demand accountability from our representatives in the United As you've already guessed, uh, we're from Occupy, uh, Occupy Bay Street, Occupy Toronto. to say thank you very, very much to uh, Stephen Lewis for coming here to address all of you tonight. It's a great honor to be, uh, to be addressed by him. Um, and uh, what we came here to ask you, uh, this, this contingent uh, from, the, uh, from the main encampment, is to ask uh, for any kind of level of support that you can give uh, Stephen Lewis to us, whether it's a verbal endorsement, a publicly made verbal endorsement, or even anything up to coming down to speaking to us. Um, anything you can offer us in the way of support, uh, we'd really appreciate it. And um, just before I, I let him respond, just let me quickly say that just to remind everybody, if you do want to come down, and we encourage you all to come down, uh, we're in Church in King, we're at the St. James Park, it's where the big church is. And uh, we welcome everybody, and we really hope you do come down. And uh, I'm sure some of the uh, members of the individual members of the contingent over here may want to ask their own questions. <coughs> individually to, uh, to Stephen Lewis, but uh, thank you very much. Second question over there. Hello. I don't, uh, I don't know if Stephen remembers me, but he had to open for me. Um, it was a university out west, and the uh, issue was literacy then. That was, uh, well, actually Canadian literacy. Canadian literacy. And uh, I felt he kind of left me in charge of it, and uh, I just wanted to update him that uh, in 1989, we uh, actually got the government to consider a law to make literacy a right in this country, but it was killed by uh, bureaucrats. So I, uh, I phoned him. And uh, the movement went away after that. Um, literacy movement in this country was, for all intents and purposes, completely vanished. And uh, it's not an issue, was an issue then as much as it is an issue now because the, gov the, the country is, is floundering for uh, transparency. Uh, the people who work every day to make this country run cannot access the information that is happening even with the internet. Because uh, those of us who struggle with uh, reading and writing rely heavily on both people who are educated and uh, people who have experience. And uh, with the death of that law, the disconnection for that particular group of people. Um, I'm seriously sorry. Um, I try. <laughs> You obviously haven't given up because you're still raising it wherever you can. Not to bring it back. Does it require a law to achieve what you want it to achieve?
obviously believe that um, we are not uh, threatened by terrorists, rather we are threatened by Egypt. We are living in a period of um, terrorism and terror that is induced by the people around us. Um, I just have this idea um, of uh, that, that you actually believe in, maybe not, but um, the, the idea of uh, living in a world with uh, human conditions versus our economy based on uh, based on immoral principles and values. Uh, could you throw some throw some light? I, I think we're fundamentally in agreement. Uh, you want to you want to live in a society where there are decent human values and where ethical considerations enter into the decisions that are made, and where people are not abusive to each other, and and uh, and where there is a, a decent regard and respect and affection. Um, people at the Wall Street occupation are talking of love, and they're talking of it quite unselfconsciously. They are attempting to embrace each other in a, in a serious way as a, as a mirror of how they think society should work. And with the students you've got here at the table with me, you've got, you've got this tremendous struggle in the Aboriginal community, which made some gain when we finally uh, got, got the apology around the residential schools. But that should just be the beginning of a complete transformation of the Canadian response to First Nations, which has been lamentable until now. I mean, we have a, a hugely discriminatory society when it comes to First Nations. The, the whole question of transit and homelessness and food for students and others who are vulnerable in society, we haven't begun to deal with adequately. And the uh, world of disability, ironically, I have a, a close colleague here with whom I work, uh, Christina McGill, and Christina and I are involved in a number of issues related to disability and, and disability and AIDS, the intersection between disabled persons and HIV, and watching the disabled movement around the world come to life when the International Convention on the Rights of Disabled Persons came into being just a year or so ago has transformed the way in which the world views issues of disability. It's still a long struggle. But what you have at the, at the front podium here is a, is a range of, uh, of injustice which can be overcome by a higher sense of moral and ethical value. And that's what we're fighting for in society. extent of rallying the, the uh, protesters at uh, St. James Memorial Park for any form of, uh, of, uh, of approval or uh, support because we're, uh, and unfortunately a lot in the mainstream media are, and including politicians, are marginalizing the movement as fringe elements when we're in fact making demands that are representative of the overwhelming majority of people from all walks of life. And anything from mainstream support from notable, respected figures such as uh, Mr. Stephen Lewis would be uh, very helpful for the movement. I, I don't have the slightest hesitation in supporting you. And if I can possibly find time and the way to, I'm, I'm in Western Canada for the next several days, but I may well be able to, to carve up some time. And if I can, I'll come down. I, I, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not uncomfortable about speaking, I can assure you. <laughs> So uh, we have a question from Joanne, and then uh, we have a second question. I don't know 
always uh, so much a question as it is a response. One of the things that I constantly hear, um, having been socially active for over 30 years, is that, and been an activist for as long, is that we, we kind of fall down. We get on these things, we get on these bandwagons, we get on issues, and then they fall flat. And you know we're still we're still trying to understand why humanity does what it does to each other. And one of the things that's very important, especially, especially in the university setting, and especially when we're communicating with each other, is words. And we talk about causes and we talk about issues. And one of the things that made indigenous um, peoples around the world uh, see the world differently was we had familiar names. We talked about Mother Earth, Father Sky, Grandfather Sun, Grandmother Moon and everyone was our family. And I think we can uh, separate ourselves with vocabulary, and we can also bring ourselves together with vocabulary. And I think uh, it's very easy for the average person to think when they see a rally or a gathering or an event that it's their issue. And it's, I really challenge everybody who believes in anything and is fighting for anything to find a way to bring it in on a human level. Uh, if you talk about uh, how this would uh, make you feel if it happened to your family, your children, instead of it being a cause, but it being a, a, an issue of humanity on humanity. And um, that's all i got to say. Thank you. To uh, get me off my seat and come up here, um, I want to tell you, my name is Polly Dyson, and I'm a student, a part-time student at uh, Ryerson University. I'm in the social work department, uh, taking social work. And I wanted to um, convey further a message uh, that uh, Becky had talked about, that we need to start here now at Ryerson University because I feel that there is inequalities between the full-time students and the part-time students in terms of me as a member of the disability community, I can't get benefits because I work at, I'm considered part-time and I pay $300 a month for my pills just so that I can survive life and get out of bed and do the work that I do and I have wonderful teachers and the support there. I went to the counseling office um, at the school to get some uh, resources and the counseling office turned me away and said, no, I'm sorry, we don't counsel part-time students because we only have the resources to counsel full-time students. And I wanted to say that for two years, uh, Caesar has been trying to get benefits for part-time students. I went to um, a member of the um, administration and they said, I'm sorry, we have so many part-time students here, we can't keep track of them all to get the benefits. Well, certainly they keep track of us to give up to uh, bill us for our tuition. So please, 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 stand up. I want Catherine Church, uh, the, the director of the disability department, to come on my side. I want you all to come on this side and help this gentleman get what he needs to get part-time students' benefits. <laughs> Do I think that economic growth and economic sustainability are mutually exclusive? No, absolutely not. Depends on the time of economic growth. If your economic growth is focused on, for example, uh, a greener economy where there is where there are alternative energy sources around wind or solar or biomass, or or if you're looking at altering the way in which housing and transit and agriculture and water, sanitation, all of these things are approached. In a, in, a, in a much more sensible way, taken out of corporate and privatized hands and abused them and turned into, through regulatory means, uh, vehicles that serve society, then you'll get both economic growth and sustainability over the long term. I wanted, I had mentioned earlier that um, Naomi Klein had spoken at um, for Wall Street uh, not long ago, I guess just a few days ago, and I am. Um, Vaguely related to Naomi, um, but I also have a very vague relationship with someone named Michelle Lansford. And if, uh, if, you, if, 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 if you want to hear a further discussion of um, of the protest movement and the Occupy movement and um, 
people like Michelle and uh, Avi Lewis having uh, an exchange on it. And tomorrow night at Trinity St. Paul's United Church, I guess it's on floor. I know Michelle is actually launching a book called Writing the Revolution, the History of the Feminist Movement in Canada. But I know uh, that there will be quite a bit of discussion around the issues that we've talked about tonight for those of you who may be interested. It starts at 7 o'clock. I am a public relations officer for the, for the Lewis Lansford clan. Uh, you're all welcome. Thank you. Or, or any other wish to answer? And Becky, you mentioned the need for the Occupy movement to um, talk to the people on the fringes of, of the protests and what happened. Because, and I agree with you because I think that um, social consciousness about social consciousness about the issues that we're talking about is very, very low. Uh, and so, my question uh, is about advice that you may have, or even the Occupy movement may have, in, in regards to people who cannot participate physically in these protests or in these movements for whatever reason. What kind of um, strategies can you? Um, suggest for those people who are unable to participate physically um, so that they can support the movement so, it, so to ensure its sustainability and its long-term sustainability long-term. I mean, I guess I would say that I think there is a remarkable number of people who are at the very least curious about what's happening, um, if not supportive. Um, and I think that there are a million ways in which we can um, articulate that, whether it is um, through writing, whether it is through conversations that happen, uh, whether it's on a university campus, whether it's in a public school, whether it's in a high school, whether it's in our workplaces, whether, I mean, the reality is, is that every place we go, everyone we talk to, um, we should be talking about this, right? If people support it, they should talk to every single person they know and say, I support it. Because what I find is that um, people are afraid to support it because they're afraid, because we have so devalued what it means to be someone who resists, um, that that is something that is so fringe, that that is something that is, you know, the, the popular message is 1% of, uh, you know, the world actually cares about these issues, not 99%. And so we just, I mean, we just need to encourage people uh, to be able to say what they actually believe um, to be true. And the rest will follow. I mean, it has been amazing to watch even the media's response to this. The other thing I wanted to say is that, I don't know, does it not astound people that there has been no critique of the actual 99% analogy Nobody's saying there's no such thing as a 1% and a 99%. It is like assumed to be true. And that in and of itself is profound. The fact that nobody's arguing with that. The fact that there is in fact just constant or a consistent agreement that there is a 99% and a 1%. I mean, that's enough for us to go on. So, I mean, talk to your parents, talk to your family, talk to your coworkers. Because um, it's in talking that I think we're actually going to move this ahead. Okay. Uh, time is running out, unfortunately, so let's just take a couple uh, at a time. I'm going to try to be strict this time. Um, so uh, we have one on this side. Uh, can we have, oh, no, I'm second mic. This gentleman, are you able to come uh, down? Okay. Let's come down, uh, and then we'll take a couple more on that side. So, uh, question one, then two, then one. I'm an engineer from Calgary, Alberta. Um, many, many of my friends are working, both directly or indirectly, working for the old sands. So my brother works for a skater company that basically uh, controls the plant for those uh, engineering, procurement, and construction companies. Um, so I always get cringe when people talk about old sands. And I know I understand you. I know that you talked about uh, economic growth and sustainability, but I know every second person that I meet works for the industry. And when the province is that dependent on an industry like that, how do you, like, what, what would you say? Um, and second perspective, the engineer, I, we, 
I know it's a very stereotyped profession. We do study a lot, but um, I don't particularly recall anybody else coming to us, talking about the social justice issues and make it relevant to us. Um, <laughs> um, so I just wondering if any of you down there are comfortable with that. I just take the last one. Two, two at a time, and then the responsibility. Just for the sake of time. Hello, uh, my name is Jesse Leclerc. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Lewis, uh, your personal hero of mine. Uh, you should have been Premier today, as dare I say, Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> it's clear that, that the, you know, that these two standard political parties haven't done anything, anything for us. We look at McGinty, we look at Harper, we look at uh, Ford, and they're making things worse. Um, I think the only obvious solution is to look for alternative political parties. Um, but how do we, you know, inspire and energize these parties to embrace movements like Occupy Toronto and other um, social movements uh, to really embrace them and to run with them instead of moderating uh, their political message to the center, which we already know doesn't work? Um, so, open question to anyone. Feel free to answer both. question that some political parties will attempt to co-opt the movement that is building, and others will dismiss you out of hand. Uh, my, my, own, my own feeling is that this is a pretty international, pretty exciting moment, and that if the momentum can continue, eventually some of the causes for which the movement stands will be embraced by progressive political groups, by progressive political parties. Um, I was really surprised at how quickly, I mean, I know Obama is in trouble and he knows he's in trouble, but I was surprised, frankly, at how quickly he began to shift ground to acknowledge what was happening on Wall Street. And I, I, I think it may be slower in Canada for a whole variety of reasons, partly because you have a political party in the Democratic left, which accepts some of the things that the movement is, is espousing. But that doesn't mean that you can't continue the pressure on the NDP as well as any of the others, because there are a number of issues which have not yet been embraced. This is a good time on the political left when, when they're looking for new leadership and new direction. Uh, as for the others, it's, you know, the pendulum always swings. That, that's what I'm <coughs> saying, that you, you keep on fighting because you dream of a better world, and one day the pendulum swings to your amazement, you made some progress. So what you have to do is grit your teeth and never stop. And accept the fact that along the way there are very powerful forces who will resist what you want, but you just are tenacious and indefatigable. You don't let them grind you down. And eventually, things shift. And what is happening internationally is unprecedented. It's really quite remarkable. And the, the violence in Italy was unfortunate. But the, but the solidarity to much of the rest of Europe was extraordinary. What's happened across the United States is frankly quite amazing. And the fact that there were 4,000 people in Vancouver without violence of any kind was really stunning. <laughs> well, I, don't, uh, I don't mean to impugn Vancouver. That, that didn't come up quite well. <laughs> They're not being a hockey game or <laughs> other incendiary devices. There was no protest in Vancouver that got out of that. Uh, so I, I have a good deal of hope for this movement. Just hang in. Someone else wants to answer the question about the tar sands. That would make me very happy. <laughs> uh, I'll just try to uh, say something on uh, to the question up there. Just that I know the stereotype of engineers. Actually, my father was an engineer. And I had a lot of friends who were engineers that uh, they do work very hard and don't necessarily have time to be involved in social justice or movements like this. That's that's the idea at least. But uh, I know that there are people who are, uh, there is a group called Engineers Without Borders. Uh, I know there is also a group called Science for Peace. And uh, there are groups that people could get involved in that, you know, could deal with these issues. And I think if there's something that interests you and if you don't find something, that maybe that's something you'd want to start. Because uh, you can start campus groups here, and I know students unions provide funding. 
and it might be something that you can you can start here and get people involved in because, <coughs> because if you don't see something, you know, if you see that that you don't see something happening, you you, you have the power, to, you know, to, to do that yourself. So I, I'm actually. Uh, Engineers Without Borders is a terrific international NGO. It's one of the best. It's amazing how quickly it has built a reputation in conjunction with Doctors Without Borders. It's very, very much revered in numbers of countries. And it has given the engineers a whole sort of dimension of humanitarian engagement, which is entirely laudable. It's just terrific. So I, I, I think that certainly is one of the answers. And I also remember when you had the Ontario Association of Professional Engineers, I remember after the terrible December 6th massacre, um, uh, the Ontario Association for Professional Engineers was fighting to get more and more women into engineering and into professional jobs, you know, occupationally, which would give them some real standing. And the president at the time, and the executive at the time, took tremendously strong public stands on these social justice issues. So I, I don't have a, I mean, I think that tar sands is a very difficult question for those who are employed in some of these areas. And if governments were prepared to find alternative energy resources and develop them urgently, you could shift occupations fairly straightforwardly. And there have been tremendous studies done on this kind of stuff. It's not unimaginable, it can happen. But we don't have governments that are in the slightest interest in doing that. Naturally, <coughs> the job becomes the centerpiece of the argument. That I, I don't dispute that that's tough. But engineers, as social justice advocates, yes, they have a strong history of that. Okay. Stephen, Becky, Dominic, and Andrea for being here. events of this week. <laughs> um, with apology to Michelle, tomorrow night we're actually doing an intergenerational dialogue on race, class, and gender with Judy Revick, Akua Benjamin, uh, Elder Joanne Delan, <laughs> and um, Michelle would prefer that you were here. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, and likewise, um, it's just, sorry, it's, that's part of the coordination. <laughs> and then Wednesday, uh, it's our overall theme for Wednesday is <coughs> learning from the resistance of indigenous people. So um, at the lunchtime, at Thomas Lunch, we have Clayton Thomas Mueller doing from the anti and Coalition is doing uh, the lunch and learn. And then in the evening, um, again, with Joanne Delaire, uh, John Cutfield from KI Nations who have done the resistance lab last year to stop the mining company from going into the area. So these are some of the key programs and please go, go on our website and take a look at what's happening. Um, I just want to say that this has been a tremendous gathering and that for this Rise in Social Justice Week, we see as Dean Ferrier said to me in our first meeting, is this is like a ripple in the pond. This is our first year doing it. And we're going to be reaching out to engineering, to business, schools, and everybody else across the campus next year. And I'm asking all of you to come and help. Like this year, for example, tomorrow, uh, we are doing a special lunch and learn with School of Journalism students. For them to meet with some of the uh, union leaders who are from the Media Guild. <laughs> And that um, tomorrow is also, we're doing a special lecture like a series with the Department of Image Arts. So those are not quote unquote the usual suspect. But as much as possible, we're gonna get the message out on social justice, justice, on equality and dignity. And I just want to close by ending with a quote, with, particularly with the Occupy Toronto. It's, it's the, the quote by Arun Hattie Roy, she says, remember these, this, we be many and they be few. They need us more than we need them. And other world is not only possible, she's on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Okay.